Good evening. And, and this is the king of all mediums. And welcome to podcast number 17. And tonight I'm going to be discussing uh, my new view towards Christians as an atheist. And um, also be discussing how my diet's been going, my new super low carb diet. And uh, we'll also take a look at five new finds. Uh, today was a beautiful day, as they all are. Again, the only one you get that you know about. Right? <laughs> Don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so always wake up, enjoy the day. Had a lovely day today. Lovely, lovely day. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, I used to be sort of a militant atheist. You know, I used to think, how can they not, how can they believe this crazy, crazy, meshuganous stuff, you know? Um... How can they believe it? I mean, I used to kind of believe it, too, until I was 17, 18. And I said, wait a second. <laughs> was, I don't know how it all started. I mean, I'll, I'll go into one of the store, you know, one day. I, I don't want to go into it now, uh, how I became an atheist. Um, but so I used to try to convince uh, believers that, you know, there is no God, there is no God and such and stuff. But, you know, my attitude changed. Uh, I always call my friend Joe, who's a devout Roman Catholic, you know, because we share the same birthday, we're the same age, 56 uh, currently, and the last conversation, the 51st birthday call did not go well, um, included him hanging up on me, of course, because he knew he was losing the debate, because, you know, as a, a Christian, you cannot win, the facts are, you know, irrefutable, there is no um, God based on, you know, evidence, unless you could come out with some evidence one of these days, and so far you have not. And um, so the 56th birthday call is a much nicer call when he started to try to come up with his, you know, uh, Christian thing. I just simply let it go. So my new, new attitude is I'm no longer in the game of trying to prove uh, there is no God because I'm quite comfortable. I don't, I don't need to prove it anymore. I, you know, I'll let my Christian friends be. You know, let them be. I don't need to harass them. I don't need to cajole them. Um, the only thing I have to say is I find myself to be much happier as an atheist. I, I find the world to be a much more interesting world. You know, science is inherently much more interesting. You know, the books I have on evolution, um, physics, chemistry are just so much interesting. When you understand how things work... Um, when you understand, like for example, that carbon, I was, I was discussing in, a, in an old uh, podcast how they do carbon dating and how the, the earth cannot be possibly 10,000 years old because we, we know through carbon dating that it's at least 50,000 years old because we could date things just by carbon dated, but there are other ways we could, but just forget about the other ways that we can date things up to 50,000 years through carbon dating. And I was describing how carbon dating works. It has, works basically that nitrogen has a 14, has a seven um, protons. And sometimes cosmic rays hit it and knock one of those uh, protons off those new, I'm sorry, it has seven uh, protons and seven neutrons. And sometimes one of the protons is knocked off, and it gets six protons, uh, six protons and eight neutrons. And by definition, the number of protons you have determines what kind of element you have. So it's no longer nitrogen; it's a carbon uh, atom. And but it's uh, not carbon. Usually has six and six, six protons, six neutrons. This type of carbon has six protons and eight neutrons because hydrogen always has 14 by definition as atomic mass so this is called carbon 14 and the thing about carbon 14 it's a radioactive type of carbon and um, so carbon 14 can be used to date things because radioactive radioactive things have half lights and they can be dated uh no i was talking about the nobel prize winning chemist in 1949 who discovered this and basically we can date because all life once it dies it starts at time zero uh, 
decaying radioactively. So we can prove basically the Earth is not 10,000 years old. It's a scientific fact, okay? So science is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Just understanding it. It just, it's a good feeling. And, you know, so that's what I convey to my Christian friends is that this is not a liberal thing. It is not a conservative thing. Science is a wonderful thing. And atheism, the rejecting of God, gods or gods, is not to be a conservative. It's not to be a liberal. It's to just look at the, the facts. There's, there's no evidence of a god or gods out there. So... Um, so don't say, oh, those, those right, those liberals, those left-wing wokes, they're all atheists. I'm going to go with God. I mean, you know, a lot of these cons Christians have been indoctrinated since birth. Same thing with Jews, same thing with Muslims, same thing with Hindus, same thing with Buddhists. And they've been, you know, so I think we need as atheists to be very gentle with these people. And my take on it is science is fascinating to me. And I think um, that's the way I approach it. And I say to Christians, listen, you're going to relearn a, a new religion, a religion of science. That's so fascinating. You're going to start understanding how the world really works, not some myths. And they're nice. I mean, you know, religion does have value. You know, it does not. You know, some atheists are out there very militant. And say, religion has no value, but of course it has some value would have stuck around as long as it does I did but um but I'm going to show you a better way you know and uh, maybe you know I'll have a show uh first the show of course I'm going to have how I became an atheist I'm going to try to figure it out I don't know because <laughs> one day I wasn't an atheist and one day I was a strong atheist I think I was more into evolution first I really wasn't an atheist per se but then when the people made fun of me at work when I said, I couldn't believe they didn't believe in evolution. I said, wait a second, you don't believe in evolution. And the next thing I said, oh, wait, they don't even believe in, they believe in God. That's why they don't believe in evolution. That brought me to really atheism. So I'm going to discuss my road from uh, as a believer, I believe I was Jewish, to uh, believing, not even believing in evolution, to believing in God. But that's another thing. And then... Maybe this will be just for, but it, you know, if you're an atheist too, I'll probably have another podcast on why, why, what makes science so fascinating. You know, just interesting ideas in science, like evolutionary psychology, um, chemistry, um, physics, you know, things that are just, you know, you learn so much. Now, if you don't believe in science, you're going to miss out on all those things. You know, a lot of, you know, people are Christians, they use science every day. You know, you have a iPhone. That does not happen without science. You take an airplane. That doesn't happen without science. Well, when, when, why does, why, why can you fly? It's just a scientific principle called uh, the Bernoulli effect. So, you know, I mean, these, these great ideas which came from Western civilization, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, it's all science. So, okay. So that, you know, just, you know, and, and as atheists, let's be more gentle. You know, this is not something a lot of them can help. You know, a lot of them, their whole world, you know. So you, you're, you're as an atheist, you're coming with a hammer and you're taking, you're, you're with a bulldozer and they've built this home of Christian Christianity and all these crazy beliefs they have, which obviously cannot be true, um, right? And, you know, again, you know, I did a podcast in my old podcast, you could probably look through on why religion cannot be true. Like one of my great uh, things was, um, you know, basically, let's say you take four religions, so four of them, but let's say, for instance, just take for example, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Mormonism, they all have a different way of getting to God, right? You know, Judaism has a certain plan, and uh, Islam has a certain plan, and Christianity has a certain plan, and Mormonism has a certain plan. So they all think they're right, which predicates that all the three other ones are wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a couple of possibilities, right? One is right and the other three are wrong. Or there's a, the more likely possibility 
that they're all wrong. <laughs> so, okay, 10 minute mark, let's move on. Second the thing is my diet. Now I've went on, as I mentioned Sunday, I began, I was very disappointed with my progress. So I began what's called my super low carb diet, which my uh, carbs have been kept under, it's more of an experiment this week, been kept under 20 grams uh, a day. And um, so right now, I started the week at 220. I woke up and I took a measure and it's 217. So it's going well. You know, again, it's not definite. You know, it could, But I think a week's a good measure of time. So if I wake up Sunday and we're at about 216, 215, I pretty much can say it's been working. I haven't done much exercise. And again, exercise, hmm, it's okay. I mean, you need to exercise. That's my belief. But you don't need that much. I mean, maybe a walk, half mile walk. I haven't really been doing that. So um, I think that could be a good thing. So um, the low-carb diet, you might ask, well, what are you eating? Well, I had Frank's today, chicken, eggs. I uh, uh, had a steak right just before I went on. And I had a salad. And, of course, and the dressing is very important. got to make sure it's a low-carb. So I had a Paul Newman oil in a vinaigrette, okay? Um so, you know, you got to make sure, you got to be careful. So everything going to my body is low carb, you know. I boy, I usually eat a potato or two with a steak, but now I've had to, you know, just for the experiment, maybe next week after the experiment's over, I'll, maybe I'll have one potato or two potatoes for the week. But uh, turkey burger, yeah, I had a turkey burger this morning for breakfast. Uh, you know, very small, just one meat. You know, maybe have four meals a day. And so far, I believe it's working. Now, the question is will it work and I think it has to work you know the question is how well it works now my plan originally was to lose one pound a week now it might be working a little better than that of course you know um I could probably ease up a little you know I probably had taken a little more carbs um and etc so okay let's go to our finds okay first find is this thing okay now I, I talked about I wanted to learn electronics, and there's probably not, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, it's it's hard to learn. You know, you take a physics course in college, and, and you know, they don't like to teach it to you. They're not good teachers. So there's a nice uh, self-study program. So you saw this on the internet. <laughs> okay. And... Um, make electron electronics I think I mentioned this before so you get the book right and um, finally this thing came in the mail a little nice little kit and it has all the things supposedly we'll find out I'll have to report back my progress do I understand what the heck's going on am I stressed out you know I'll have to talk about the flow channel a little bit uh, um, you know an, an idea by McHigh Mekhi six cents me high, you know, flow is the idea, Mekhi, that's his name, Mekhi, translate in English, Michael St. Michael, Mekhi, Hungarian name, it's very difficult to spell, and his idea in flow is, to make, to, the key to happiness is to have challenges in your life, see, if you don't have challenges, you're bored, but the challenges have to be doable, because if they're too difficult, then you get frustrated, oh, man. You get frustrated and stressed out, but if they're too easy, then you get bored. It's like, oh, this the job's too easy. But if they're too hard, and it's just you can't do it. It's like, you give up, and you get depressed, and you get anxious, and you get. So we'll have to. I have to report now. Now before I do this, of course, I have to make a plan. So I have to think, how much do I want to do this? So I'll have to map that out and report it back. So. Um, I'll have to take a look at the book and think, you know, how often I'll have to do it. I'll have to look at the chapters. I'd say probably twice a week. You know, once a week might be a little lot. Uh, I mean, once a week might be a little too less because the mind might be stimulated. I think twice a week is good because and maybe Sunday and Wednesday night, the nights I don't do the podcast would be good for those because that'll put in a nice slot. So maybe a 45 minutes, 15 minutes, sort of like a... a class so that'd probably be good so this way i have two nights a week one night might be you know you don't have enough stimulation on the topic but so electronics is good for me especially i like audio equipment 
and you know it might you know maybe a, a one day repair so the only thing bad is i'm not good at getting it because a lot of these old audio equipment are difficult to get into you know uh if they were built well, you know, you can get into them and repair them. So I might have the knowledge of how to fix them once I get into them. But the problem is getting into them. Some people, that's one of the probably the most important things. So you need both. You need the knowledge of how to get into them, too. Okay. So that's first thing. And the second thing, now the second album I got, the first album I got... Uh, from the association the association was a sunshine pop in the 60s and along comes mary and cherish were two big hits and i thought the first album was okay now the second album is called insight out the association and they put their big hit on this one windy who's tripping around the streets of the city now this album i actually found to be a lot better and i'll tell you why the two hits on this are um, let me show you first of all. Bones Howell, again, the famous producer, is one of the great, you know, you put a lot of these, you know, the Fifth Dimension, you know, the Mamas and the Pond, like, you know, a lot of these great groups together. Um, and they had session guys a lot of on this. Um, so the two hits on this are Windy, of course, and Never My Love. Two very, very good um, songs, great songs. Now, the thing I thought about this album was better. The secondary songs were much better. And the one that really stood out was the last song, Reclined for the Masses. I thought that was a terrific song. Um, almost good. I mean, they have it on their Greatest Hits album, and uh, it's almost a great song. So, you know, so it's a very, very good album. And I suggest, you know, again, so with this association, you know, you like Sunshine Pop, like Moms and the Pop, as Fifth Dimension. You might be tempted to, again, get the, uh, come on, come on, man. You might be tempted, but these first two albums, I was impressed with, especially this one. So I would, you know, they say, again, I'm getting, and again, the great thing about vinyl is, you get the album and the album you get these beautiful pictures let me show you you, know, you really get back into the mood you can't get this with a cd you know see and you get the uh, picture and they had when they i wonder if that this still if you look you see the association fan club 24th north mentor pasadena there's no zip code. I wonder if that's still available. Uh, 53, 54 years ago. 54 years ago. So that's, yeah, you might want to join the association <laughs> fans. I wonder if uh, that's still available. Okay. Let's go with a book next. Okay. So I was, um, one of my favorite um, psychologists, again, as I mentioned, was the uh, um, late uh, Albert Ellis. 1913 to 2006, I do believe. And uh, he was a humanist. He was an atheist. And he was a... Uh, got a little... I think he got, towards the end, he got a little senile. You know, a little cranky. He used to hit people with his cane. And things like that. It was too a nice guy. It was kind of a rough New York guy. A weird guy. You figure one of these, you know, really... You know, he never was like, uh, you know... Not the type of guy you would think. But he was... Um, he was um, one of these uh, cognitive. He really, you know, he claims he, he invented everything, and he claimed he's, he actually called something rational emotive uh, therapy, or and then he changed the rational emotive behavioral therapy. And that um, the guy, I forget the guy who invented the other one, the cognitive behavioral therapy, became more um, wider known, and then that became very. And that today is the most biggest form of psychotherapy and it's very effective for combating depression. You take your thoughts and you say, is that really true? Am I the ugliest man in Forest Hills that's 56 years old? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, 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 I can't be. I gotta be someone uglier. You know? I was like, <laughs> but you don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> well, many unattractive people don't have <laughs> But you're handsome. Maybe a lot of girls look at you and interesting things. So I, uh, go to the supermarket today and I bought um, you know so I go to the supermarket this nice looking Colombian girl she's a cashier so I've been flirting with her I gave her my phone number and of course she never called in 
she says, oh, would you buy me chocolate? <laughs> so, maybe this, so, you know, because I, I went back, I, I forgot eggs, so I went back, got eggs, and she goes, um, would you buy me chocolate? I said, sure, <laughs> not a problem. I don't know what that means. Maybe she's just trying to milk me for my money. <laughs> you know, so, all right, it was an interesting thing. Okay, so the next thing uh, we're going to take a look at now. Okay, so in the book I ordered humanistic psychology, but for some reason they they said, they quote they, they emailed me and they said, oh, listen, we can't send that to you. It's in such poor condition. We can't send that. She said, I really wanted textbook in humanistic psychology. It looked very interesting. So I said, okay. So I looked on their thing, and I used to have this book until they took away my possessions and tossed every single one of them, and. Um, it's called Barefoot in Babylon. Very old book by Bob Spitz. It's a new edition. I think this, very, he first wrote the book 10 years after the, uh, uh, Woodstock, so that was 1979. I think this was in 1989. So it's still about a 31, 32 year old book. And very excellent book, excellent book. One the best, this was the best book I ever read on Woodstock. And, um, when uh, the new Woodstock Festival, when the anniversary comes, and I got a real surprise. I was going to put it up today, but I can't find it because I lose everything when the uh, it comes up. But I read, so I got this instead. It's an excellent book. So if you have a chance, when you go to eBay and um, pick this up, if you're interested, you like Woodstock, and not all of you are into Woodstock 69. I'm a, in fact, my old site was called um, Hippie Dave. 69 it was about all about woodstock that was they started and of course you run out of things to say about woodstock so you have to but i'm gonna have a big package around well the festivals basically um okay basically there are three <laughs> that i go i cover i cover uh the first one is the monterey pop festival you'll see some video on that june 6 we'll talk a little bit about that and then the uh of course woodstock august 15th to august 18th whatever and then, of course, Altamont. <laughs> I actually have a poster of that. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of guy gets a poster of uh, Altamont? So, okay. Last item. Okay, so. How I got into this guy? And how did I get into him? Um, I saw a review in... in uh, one, of my, one of the guys I know said, you know, played an album, and I think... And I saw him on Letterman. Letterman was always a big fan. And this guy really deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, you're telling me Tupac. <laughs> it's funny. When I see these idiots about 10 years younger than me, I say, oh, Tupac, he was great. You know? Now, I got two CDs for the price of one. And who is this guy? And he's kind of a cult following. You know, A lot of people don't know about him. And this guy is Warren Zevon. Let me do one at a time. Cause, uh, okay, so the first of the CDs is the best of Warren Zevon. And he's always been kind of a pessimist. He always has one of his famous things is a, well, he, he used, sometimes he uses a, a skull with his glasses and a cigarette dangling out of it. <laughs> That's one of his favorites. So I, I got two CDs. I used to have a lot of the CDs, but again, I lost all my possessions. Okay, so I, I, I saw the CD, and um, I was like, this is pretty good. And it's just the greatest hits. It goes over his career, and it does a pretty good job. Some of the songs, Poor, Poor, Fitiful Me, that was covered by Linda Ronstadt, the French Inhaler. If you don't know what a French Inhaler and, and hail is, it's when someone takes a, a cigarette, takes an inhale, takes it from a mouth, and puts it in her news, it's it, it's uh, I guess the French do it. I don't know. Carmelita, um, song about guys strung out on heroin, hasten down the wind. Okay, Werewolves of London. Okay, that's probably his biggest song. Um, I'll probably do a, a survey on uh, Werewolves of London. Okay, that'd be one of them. Rolling the headless Thompson gunner. Uh, one thing I don't like, he calls Palestine. There is no Palestine, by the way. <laughs> okay, excitable boy. Okay, that's another famous song. Lawyers, guns, and money. That's probably another one. So that would be right there. I think we got four. But let's see. Interlude number one. Played all night long. Play all night long is a uh, great song. <laughs> it's a, another great song. A certain girl. Don't know that one. That must be with this period. The the the, the, the rehab period. 
looking for the best neck thing. That's his uh, rehab period. Before his rehab period, the in, in between, where he wasn't doing too well. Then he comes out of the swinging. He comes out of the rehab period. Detox Mansion, which is about an experience. We hung out with uh, Liza Minnelli and uh, Elizabeth Taylor doing a, re a detox. Uh, Reconsider Me is a nice song. Boom Boom Mancini, that's a great song. Splendid Isolation, another great song. Raspberry Beret, which is a Prince cover, interesting. Searching for a Heart, that's a great song. Things to do in Denver when you're dead, just a bit example. It does later create, lost some of his mojo, but Mutineer. I was in the house when the house burned down, that's a great song. And Genius 22, okay. So, pick this up, trust me, <laughs> great album. Okay, so I got it. The second one came together. I forgot they were very cheap. This is a live album. And I saw him live. with the, He opened for Eddie Money. And he played just a guitar and he had a harmonica. He's terrific. He blew Eddie Money off it. <laughs> okay. And Eddie Money was smoking, chain smoking. I think that eventually led to his esophageal cancer. So this, yeah, here's one of the, uh, so let me show you the front cover. And of course, <laughs> Mr. Zivon doing something he should not be doing. I don't know if it led to his death. He had uh, mesothelioma, which is the risks are increased by smoking. Although it's, you can get it too if you do not smoke. You hang around asbestos a lot. Okay, this is a live album. Splendid Isolation, great song. Lord of Guns, Money, Mr. Bad Example. Good lyrics, the music that's good. Excitable Boy, one of his greatest songs. Hasten down the one. Okay. French and Hell is a great song. The Warrior King. It's okay. Roland Corral. I don't know what that is. Roland the Headless Thompson. Gonna one the best, best song. Searching for Hearts, a good song. This is part of a movie. I forget which. Boom Boom Mancini. Great song. Jungle Work. Okay. Piano Fighter. His early songs. See, I, I could put four, but they're, you know, they're just like his, his standards. Werewolves of London, of course. The Indifference of Heaven. That's one of my his favorite songs. Uh, maybe I'll put that in instead of one. <laughs> that's a beautiful song. Indifference of Heaven, if you never hear. Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me. That's the Linda Ronstadt cover. And play it all night long. One of the great, great. I mean, you got to get He's He is just so terrific. Uh, Mr. Zivon. Okay, so that about does it tonight. And uh, wow, we're going to come in a little under 28 minutes. And... Again, it's beautiful. This is March 4th. Wow, we're going to get to spring and a lot of exciting stuff coming. I just like, love this. I love you people. You're great. I wish I could hug you all, but I can't. So I gotta, I'm got going to sacrifice something I really love, <laughs> as Jimmy once said in Monterey. In fact, June 6th, that's the first. I also have another festival. Um, um, I, you know, I, well, I might have to get to that. I don't want to get the DVD, though, because... Yeah, the New York Power Festival, which was in July. So I got June, July, August, and I got, of course, Altamont in December, um, which was not pretty. So, all right, so have a great day and a uh, groovy evening, and we'll see you tomorrow.